Hi everyone and welcome to lecture number 10, which is on wine in the Middle Ages. And I'm appropriately wearing my um, t-shirt from Heidelberg, which you might think is a place for beer, but actually it's a wine region in Germany. So um, what we're going to talk about mostly today is the wine trade. Um, why that suddenly booms after the year 1000 um, in terms of the production, in terms of trade, in terms of um, rebuilding the whole infrastructure that fell apart after the Roman Empire. And I think many of these interconnected events, the increase in trade, the growth of cities, a serious population boom, um, and eventually things like universities are part of this whole thing. Ultimately, you can trace the cause of these, and I know this is going to sound a little simplistic, but I think what triggers all of this to happen in the first place, after the year 1000 or so, is very simple. It's a rise in temperature. The world gets warmer. Summers were significantly hotter by several degrees. What this means is the geographic limits of wine production are pushed to the north, um, and they are also uh, pushed to higher elevations where you can actually grow grapes because it's just warmer. Um, and I think this longer growing season also meant that land on which vinifera grapes could not be brought to maturity before, um, suddenly they can start growing grapes in those places and planting vineyards, um, like the north of England, for example. So the, um, the consequence, the immediate consequence of this rise in temperature is, of course, more food. Uh, the population grew from about 30 million to about 60 million in three centuries. That's really dramatic population growth in, in world history. Um, and uh, other things, perhaps a lower infant mortality rate, um, fewer famines due to a more steady food supply and better infrastructure. And, and I think part of this also, strangely enough, is fewer Viking raids, fewer, uh, less sort of instability of society from being um, by marauded upon, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but those Vikings actually settled down into relatively stable kingdoms, um, or they found new homes in places like Normandy in the north of France or in Sicily even. So I think most significantly for the trade is, of course, the growth of cities, again, um, since classical antiquity, and that means a demand for wine. And I would say probably equally important is that society was increasingly stratified, meaning there's lots of different kinds of people, um, not just, um, you know, elites on the top and the very poor below, but lots of middling sort of professionals, um, not just uh, in the wine growing regions, of course, but everywhere throughout Europe. And what that means is that people increasingly are demanding wine as an expression of their position, social position, their wealth, their power, whatever. If they can afford wine, they want it. Um, and uh, because it, you know, signals class and uh, distinction. So um, I would say equally important um, are the, um, let's say the, the Germanic tribes who once drank beer and mead, right, for the most part, experienced a kind of shift in taste toward wine, precisely because it was something that could distinguish them from the ordinary people, from the masses. And even middle class merchants and artisans could aspire to drink wine as um, a kind of uh, an expression of their upward mobility, right? Drinking, eating, wearing clothes, adopting modes of speech that kind of signaled their status that is not quite noble, of course, but not common peasant either. They want to be distinguished from those way below them. Um, so quite simply, the demand for wine rose dramatically, and of course, wine production did also after the year 1000. Um, we saw an increased demand, I think even under Charlemagne around the year 800, there's, there's actually wine he donated for wine cultivation. Um, he ordered wine to be grown and provided for his troops while on campaigns. And there's actually a very interesting text, um, which is called the Capitularies, which uh, specifies the food that's grown, the wine that has to be grown and basically to feed his army. But after the year 1000, I think we're dealing with something very different. The demand was so great that we could actually call it a boom in the industry, um, with some regions shifting toward almost complete devotion to uh, wine manufacture and then export. Um, and then equally, I think there's stimulus to produce better wine. And what I mean by that is wine that can withstand shipping. 
um, I should tell you, and I'll repeat it in class today, is that the wine we made in class um, exploded yesterday. <laughs> I must have, I bottled it before it was done f fermenting and the top blew off and literally it was a geyser. It was just unbelievable. I still have a little left, but a lot of it is went on the floor. So that, so the stability of it um, really comes from careful wine production, you know, um, and what this means for the um, shipping is generally a higher alcohol content. That's going to make wine more stable and not less prone to going bad, of course. Um, but better production methods to grow vines that have higher sugar content, that's, of course, um, going to give you that higher alcohol and better understanding of where to situate vines, how to um, um, make trellises more effective, better grafting systems. And of course, when, even if you have great wine, you need good roads to get, get it to your customers, right? Uh, or rivers, of course, you know, rivers are actually far more important for, uh, for trade within Europe. And, and of course, over the sea, right? You need better navigational techniques, um, more seaworthy ships and compasses. And so all this stuff kind of comes together at the same time. Um, and so just as culture was revived after you could say a long hiatus in the the so-called dark ages in the west um i think the revival of culture is accompanied by a a um revival of viticulture right it's not to cult means to to rise right cult culture um those are very closely related words for a good reason um and i think there were even outlying regions brought under cultivation in the middle ages which are actually not um, places you'd really find wine grown today. Uh, Northern France, in fact, Normandy, some places that they don't really grow much wine. Um, in England, England does grow wine today because it's getting hotter again, but, but it's um, uh, Flanders, places that, that are just not known for wine making today um, were in the Middle Ages uh, because it was warmer. Um, elsewhere, forests were cleared, marshes were drained, uh, and that's this is for agriculture in general, but I think also some places really devoted themselves to grape production, um, and some of them specialized in wine, um, and they are to this day the great wine-producing regions of Europe. Bordeaux, uh, Burgundy, the Rhone Valley, the Rhineland, the Moselle in Germany, um, and the key to everything, if you want to see what the key to all civilization in the Middle Ages is, and in fact, right up to the Industrial Revolution, it's a river, right? If you have river transport, you can get your goods around. And if you look at where the cities are, are um, distributed across Europe, it's always uh, on the seacoast or inland on a river. Um, that's just river traffic is very, very important. Um, I think equally important is the fact that... Um, the Muslim power in the Iberian Peninsula was pushed back in a whole process that is called the Reconquista, Reconquest, let's say, um, where, uh, and of course there is some wine production under the Moors. I think, I don't want to suggest that it's completely gone because of course there were um, um, Christians and Jews living in, in Muslim Spain um, after 711, but um, by after the, about the 12th, 13th century, the Muslims begin to be pushed out um, in that reconquest, and the um, and under Christian rule, following the reconquista, vineyards just expand unchecked. Okay? So it's not just a small number of uh, Mozarabs or Sephardic Jews that are making wine. It was actually um, the the bulk of the population. Other, and whole regions are devoted to wine production. Rioja, maybe. Um, Catalonia, who definitely grow great cava and lots of other kinds of wine. Um, and in the, in the um, south, though, where, you, where, where it gets very hot, one of the hottest places in Europe, the very south, um, the, um, they begin to make a special kind of wine, which is very unusual and is um, meant for largely for export. And this is called sherry. The, the place we're talking about is Jerez, um, which is a... Um, port on the southern coast of Spain. Um, sherry is just a corruption of that word, but it's a, it's a wine that is strangely oxidized and fortified, so, um, and sometimes very sweet. You know, uh, there are cream sherries and olorosos and there's finos, which are dry, but, but the, um, this is, from the start, uh, an article of export. And the importance, again, of the, um, is that the higher sugar and alcohol content helps it withstand shipping, right? So, um, and, you know, from this period, the Spanish wines are being shipped to England. You know, that's, that's um, 
you know, that taste for sherry. I think that's has, has a lot to do with a lot of events in history. Wars with France, for example, England turns to Spain for its wine supply. But this is but, but it's beginning here. Okay, uh, a butt of sherry, you know, or sherry sack is what they would call it. Sack. Um, by the time when we get to Shakespeare's time, um, the situation is a little different in Italy. Um, Viticulture actually didn't end with barbarian invasions entirely, um, but the trade collapsed. Uh, and especially the most important thing was the luxury goods that would have been coming from the East. Uh, and that includes Greek wine, um, by and large fell apart in those, um, let's say six, seven centuries after the Roman Empire. Um, so what happened in Italy is the production became very small, very localized. Um, and Italy, after a thousand, experiences the most dramatic population boom in Europe and there is a tremendous growth of cities. It's the most urban place definitely in, in Europe um, and the population doubled between the 11th and 14th century, especially north, northern Italy is what we're really talking about here. Um, southern Italy is a, an, an exception. And many of these cities, um, for example Venice and Genoa, specialized in trade with the East, and that meant spices and jewels and silk and things like that. But for our purposes, it's sweet wines from Cyprus and Crete. This is the Malmsey. Remember we talked about Malmsey in class? This is a um, Monemvasia or Malvasia is the, is the grape, um, but that's a real marker of status. It's expensive. It's sweet. It's high in alcohol. It uh, can ship anywhere, but that's the, that's, if you're rich, that's what you want to drink. Okay? Um, and uh, with intensification of trade and business, you know, you need monetary transactions, you need laws that govern them, you need rules um, that work internationally. So there's an increase in banking, and I would say Florence, more than anyone, excels in that. There are banking houses, the, the Accaiuoli and Bardi and Peruzzi, they have banks all throughout Europe where people can trade money and have letters of credit and... Um, and uh, factors that are that represent the company that are appointed in those cities. So it's so really um, trade is facilitated by things like that, including mathematics, algebra. You know, okay. Um, so the um, and double double entry bookkeeping. I should mention also. So, but the general pattern was for wealthy families inside cities. Um, this is in Florence to invest in land in the countryside grow grapes kind of as an investment, um, and then making wine that would then later be shipped to the city where they sold it again, right? To the people who don't have land or cities. So Tuscany is probably the best example of this. Um, and of course the wealthy city folk provided an excellent market for better wines, you know, for the, for the exported stuff, but they still had local, local produce, definitely. Um, now the system of land owning in Italy, in Tuscany, but elsewhere also, is a strange kind of arrangement. It's called mezzadria, which means half and half, uh, or half halvesy system, let's say. Um, it's kind of like sharecropping. The person who owns the land will get half the produce, and the person who actually farms it for that owner will also get half. And that, that is their rent. Now, 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 of course, you have to make a lot, um, because you're only getting half of the produce, um, but it's not your land. So, you're, so it's not exactly tenancy, it's just a weird sharecropping system. Um, and they would, of course, if they made wine, furnish him with half the whole product, you know, and he could use it for his household, he could resell it in the city, he could um, barter it to a, a negoci negociant, which is a, um, that's a French word, but it means, means a, um, a middleman merchant who will actually do the retail, he'll buy it from you and then he'll get it to the, to the customers. Um, so the so the interesting thing, the result of this system, is that production tended to be very small um, holdings and and relatively backwards. Um, the technology was not really advanced because, of course, you'd need a lot of money to invest in you know a really effective press and you know animals and whatever. Um, and so the wine in Italy tends to remain in the region. It's not really exported very far, and it tends to be pretty, I shouldn't say bad, but it's, it's not great wine made for traveling. Um, and the other thing that, that I guess is relevant here is if you're traveling within Italy, there aren't a whole lot of navigable rivers, right? The, the Arno doesn't go very far, um, and uh, the Po is really the only major, major river in the north. Um, and there's a mountain range that goes right up the middle of, of Italy, the Apennines. So, so it's, it's excellent for growing wine, but it's not really good for transport. Um, and uh, 
Nonetheless, consumption is pretty high. You know, people um, have estimated about a gallon a week per person, um, but almost all of it is made and consumed locally. So what's weird is it, it kind of goes against the trend that I'm talking about, about, uh, you know, further exports and, and industrialization, if you can use that word. You know, and we're not talking about machines, but, but large-scale wine growing for export. Um, We'll take a look at some images of, of winemaking in the Middle Ages because it's really quite interesting and probably not surprise, no surprises in there. But, um, but I think we also get a good sense of what medieval Italian viticulture is like from a beautiful farming manual. This is by a guy named Petrus Crescentius. And I'll actually, sh I have a beautiful facsimile. So I'll, should I grab it? Maybe I'll do that. I can remember where it is. Hold on one second. <laughs> I've, um... I actually just want to show this to you <laughs> for those of you who are online and watching. This is a, um, a facsimile of it, but it is so beautiful. <laughs> this is, you know, what the manuscript actually looks like. Um, and you can see it's got all these beautiful first letters, and this is a little section on um, Pisum et Robelium, I think. So this is about uh, peas. Um, it's, a, it's a farming manual in any case. This was written between 1304 and 1309. Uh, Petrus was a lawyer from Bologna, which is a big university town, um, and he retired from teaching and said, you know, I think I want to write a farming manual <laughs> to teach people how to run a rural estate because it'll be fun and it will be profitable. Um, and he's really a fascinating person. I've written about him um, in, uh, a few times, but um, but he becomes like sort of the the authority on agriculture in this period. And the book was copied extensively. And actually, the, it's also, when the printing press arrives in the middle of the 15th century, it's one of the first books ever printed. So you can actually find copies of the printed version online, um, if not the, um, the manuscript itself. So the, um, let me read you just a little bit. This is from book four, Types of Grapes. This is from the 1486 Strasbourg edition. And I'm going to translate this absolutely literally um, from Latin. So... Um, this is my translation. We find so many types of grapes, and they are called by many diverse names in various provinces and cities. However, from these, some are better and some less good. First, I'll write on the best of these and the good conditions and their names. Uh, then, more briefly, I'll say something about the less good. In order to recognize the customs of each, you'll want to know which vines to plant or to seed and which will be best. I say thus, the best is a particular species of grape called Sciana, which spring forth rather late. It's a white grape and somewhat round, having seeds and shapes moderately large and canes, grape clusters and leaves moderately spaced. And he, he just goes on and on telling you exactly how to plant it, what kind of yield you're going to get, how much in, you know, uh, input you need and things. So it's really a very practical farming manual for someone who wants to um, do this themselves. Uh, he lists 37 different grape varieties. Um, it's not always clear which grapes their modern equivalents are, but some are recognizable. The um, Sklava, for example, is probably Schiava. Uh, what he calls Greica is Greco, which is a, which is a grape type. Um, Vernaccia, we have the, the exact same grape today. Vernaccia, like Di San Gimignano, is a very, it's a lovely, um, light greenish wine. It's really beautiful stuff. You can still find this. Um, Tribbiana, he says, uh, will give you very small fruits. It takes a long time for the vines to become productive. So you be patient, I guess. Um, but in any case, a lot of it, what's interesting about the book, and I think this is, you know, we'll be talking about this more often, is that a lot of his vice is actually taken from classical authors. He's been reading Columella and Cato and Palladius, who wrote centuries and centuries before. So strangely, some of the recommendations he makes are actually revival of classical techniques that had disappeared in the, in the you know, preceding many centuries. Um, and I think what is, um, what is obvious about what Petrus Crescentius is doing here is he's making very detailed considerations to match the grape type with a particular soil quality, level of um, ele uh, elevation, uh, sun exposure, things that, that are really the heart of viticulture, right? Of um, like how you 
grow grapes, you can't just throw any old grape in any soil. It's not always going to work. You have to consider how much moisture the soil has, whether it's got chalk or loam or gravel. That's going to make a very big difference. And I would call it a kind of systematic viticulture. It's not scientific, really. I mean, he's got no scientific method to this, but it's, but it's methodical. He's really testing a lot of different things. And what he's trying to do is improve the wine by looking at not just how it's grown, but where it's grown, matching the grape to the right soil and climate and temperature uh, and place. And that is the key to good winemaking. So if you want to say where does modern sort of viticulture and winemaking start to become systematic, it's here. It's with Petrus um, in the 1300s. Um, so the let's talk about how most wine was grown, though. Um, the system in... Um, not quite as prevalent in Italy, but in most of Europe, and especially in France, uh, Spain, it's also there, and in much of Germany, is called feudalism. Okay? And you probably, I'm sure you've heard that word before. It basically means that a nobleman who owns the land passes down that land in perpetuity to his heirs, the eldest heir. It's a primogeniture system. So it's always the same size, and if that person marries into another house, you can get it bigger. So the tendency is for feudal holdings to grow. Um, the labor is provided by someone called a serf, S-E-R-F, not serf, like, you know, do, 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 no, it's serfs. Um, now, a serf is not a slave, okay? That's, there's a, a difference. You can't buy or sell the people, okay? They, they are, however, tied to the land. They come with the land, and they can't leave. Um, they can't say, oh, I don't like working here. I'm going some, somewhere else. So they're stuck there. They're bound to the soil in a certain sense. Um, and they are inherited with the land itself. When if, if the lord of a manor dies, um, his eldest son will inherit and all the serfs come with it. Okay, um, And the production of um, food and, of course, grapes and whatever... Um, tends to be communal. So what that means is that an entire village will share in the duties of cultivation um, and most of the, the food and wine that they grow is for their own subsistence. They, this is a, a subsistence agriculture, meaning it's hand-to-mouth. Whatever they grow, they consume uh, by and large. Um, but a couple of days a week, they have to also go and work on what's called the Lord's Demean, D-E- um, M-E-S-N-E, -E, Demean, okay? That's his own private land, okay? That, that, and the produce that comes out of that land and the labor that they put onto it um, is entirely his. He gets to do with that produce what he wants. He can feed his retainers, people who fight with him and hang around with him and drink, or he can actually sell it too. Um, so in a sense, he gets labor on his vineyards, that's what we're talking about now, um, for nothing. And he gets to also direct the production of that wine so he can make better wine if he really wants, right? Um, he can invest in improvements. He can, um, ultimately, if he keeps buying more land or inheriting it, he can um, have multiple holdings, have lots of the best land, you know, vineyards in, in a region, and bottle it in um, on a large scale. And of course, well, they don't have bottles, but you know, barrel it on a large scale and sell it. So I should mention um, another very important thing is a lot of these very large estates are not owned by noblemen, but by monastic orders. Remember all those monks accidentally getting rich, being left land because it's a pious benefaction to the order? Um, they end up being large-scale winemakers sometimes. Um, and so a monk a monastery could have its own serfs working the land for them. Um, there are also sharecropping systems elsewhere in Europe. The south of France is something similar to the Mezzadria. It's called uh, metaillage. So, so I don't want you to think this is, you know, the one system that rules everywhere in Europe. There's actually several different permutations of it. Um, but feudalism is more or less the rule. Um, and in distinction to Italy, wine becomes the number one export item in medieval France the most important. Um, and it's basically why the English were so interested in holding on to much of France, especially Bordeaux, um, is because that region supplied England exclusively. Those wines from um, what was uh, during the Angevin Empire was part of England, and there was trade going from Bordeaux to London, or Bristol, you know. Um, and it's why England fought for France in the, in, you know, in the Hundred Years' War. Um, 
the wealthy mercantile cities of the Low Countries, places like Bruges, Ghent, Brussels, they were also supplied, um, supplied by Burgundy. That's the only other really urban place in Europe. Um, and um, because they were under the same ruler in the 15th century, Burgundy uh, supplied them with wine. Burgundy also supplied the papal court, which moved to Avignon in the south of France in the 14th century. Um, the Rhone is situated right nearby. That's also a wine-growing region. Uh, think of Chateauneuf du Pape. That's, that's the Pope's vineyard, basically. Um, and as a rule, that any place that has the right temperature and um, they can focus on winemaking and export that wine. Um, manufacture it on a large scale, put it in barrels, get it out on ships. Um, and this explains why Bordeaux, why the Loire Valley is a wine growing region, why the Rhone, um, and also the Rhine in Germany. Totally, Rhine and Moselle are, are um, river transports for, largely for wine, and they are to this day. I mean, when I was in Heidelberg, we drove an hour and we were in the center of an enormous wine producing region, just gorgeous, gorgeous, toward the east. Um, so, but it's because of the river, because of the wine there, where they could get the get the wine out. Um, and I should say another very important um, development here is the new shipbuilding technology um, that can hold all these barrels. Instead of longboats, which of course you can you know picture like a Viking longboat, that's the sort of thing. Instead of those, they start building things called a cog, and a cog is a rounder ship. It has a single mast and a square rig. So instead of having a triangular or Latin sail that, that, you know, Viking ships have, this is a much bigger square sail that's more maneuverable. Um, and um, a stern-mounted rudder, which means, you know, you, you're more control over where you're steering, um, and a much bigger hull. So this is a much bigger, a cog is a big sort of tub-like ship, so you can hold many wine barrels. Um, and in fact, what is interesting is that a ship's capacity is measured in tons, T-U-N-S. And what that refers to is not ton weight, T-O-N, um, but T-U-N, which is a barrel. How many barrels does a ship hold? So when you see 125 ton carrick, that means it holds 125 barrels of wine, of course. Um, so, um, and a standard ton or tonneau is 252 gallons and a cog could hold about 200 of those barrels. So that's a lot of wine getting shipped, okay? Um, eventually the decks are closed in, so it rains, you have no trouble. Eventually they have fore and aft castles, which are those, you know, raised parts on the ship um, on either side. And actually, while I'm at it, let me, let me just show you. This is, I have a, a galleon here. It's not a, not a, uh, a, um, It's not a cog, but you can see what I'm talking about here. This is the four and aft castles right there. This is square rigging. A cog would only have one. This has two masts and a sprit sail up there. This is, if you recognize it, this is the Santa Maria. <laughs> it's, it's later, of course. You know, this is not a medieval ship. I just wanted you to know what I'm talking about here. Um, so new winemaking technology, the cog is the standard medieval ship. It's the ancestor of those, of caravels and, um, and galleons. So the idea is to get the wine, let's say from Bordeaux to England as quickly as possible after the harvest. It took about a week to get there. Uh, the barrels would be tapped and the wine consumed directly out of the barrel. Okay. And what that means is the Bordeaux would have been a very different wine from what's made there today. Um, it would have to be much younger. Um, it would begin to oxidize the moment um, the barrel was opened um, and the level of wine went down. Um, and notice again, what they're missing is bottles, right? Unless you were maintaining a huge household or a tavern, the point is that it's very difficult to buy a small amount of wine. It's not something you can take away, you know, a little a bottle's worth or a jug's worth. Um, so wine really is for the luxury market for the most part. Um, and it was never expected that you would ever hold the wine more than a year or so, um, at which point it would, it would go bad and you'd of course have a new harvest, so you wouldn't need it. Um, so wine is not an investment under any circumstances. It's not meant to hold, it's not something you'd buy and hope to sell for more later. In fact, if anything, as it ages, it gets worth less. Um, and it's really weird, ironically, that the ancient wine that was stored in clay amphorae lasted many years 
but the amphora go extinct along with ancient shipping methods and, gal and when galleys go extinct so do the amphora um, in the medieval cog a barrel which you you know put on its side and you roll this way um, you roll it up the deck into the hull it's very very easy to, to transport but it wine doesn't last as long anymore um, and the, the really high quality stuff um, comes from the Mediterranean and as I mentioned before it's Greek it's Greek Malmsey uh, or Malvasia it's sweet wine from Crete and both of these were um, at times controlled by Venice so that's that's um, an important as, as was Cyprus um, and some of this wine can get to about 14 15 percent alcohol um, the ships also carried spices which were used for cooking and medicine um, but they also went into the wine remember that um, and this trip this trip the trip from the Mediterranean took several months it was more difficult to navigate uh, and I think it explains why in the course of the Middle Ages the Italians become the expert ocean going navigators uh, they become the map ma makers they become the makers of navigational in instruments um, well into the modern age so you know think of uh, Columbus and Amerigo Vespucci and Caboto you know John Cabot all the great navigators were Italian because they start on it very early shipping through the Mediterranean um, another important trade route is the German wine that was transported down the Rhine and by down I mean in a northern northward direction to uh, Holland and then to England uh, and then from there to the Baltic and to the rich cities of the Hanseatic League these are these are wealthy German trading cities throughout the the Baltic region um, like um, Rostock and Lübeck and Danzig and all the way to really St. Petersburg. That's, that's a, an enormous wine trade. Um, Bremen, Hamburg, um, Visby, all the, these are all um, sort of part of this very important trading network. And wine is one of the things, um, beer we'll see also, but wine is one of the, the important items of, um, of export. And so wine and other luxury goods, this is the way it goes from the south and the wine producing regions to Denmark, to Sweden, to Poland, to Finland, to Russia eventually. Um, these are very important places. And in return, what those places send back is also key, is iron, is uh, wood for the masts and the ships, pitch to make them waterproof, um, furs from from so there's a lot of raw materials out there that are coming the other way so the Hanseatic League becomes very very wealthy um, and it's um and the German wine trade itself is centered mostly on the Rhine the Mosul and a couple of other rivers so it's in in the um, western part of Germany uh, they're mostly they do make reds but, um, uh, but mostly light white wines like Elbing, Tramina, Riesling um, a couple of light red, reds like Blauburgunder is beautiful. Um, it's a, like Pinot Noir. Um, and if you think about like sort of the colder regions of wine growing in the U.S. like Washington and Oregon, they grow similar kinds of wines. Um, you know, um, I, I'm not sure why we don't, we don't know them as well as the, we do French wines, but they can be really, really exquisite. Um, and the idea is it's a little colder, it's a little more damp, um, and the um, grapes are usually lifted on trellises away from the from the ground, so they don't obviously they don't rot there. Um, and but they're low enough to pick. And actually, it's um, really interesting. I've been been to vin vineyards like this, gosh, in way in um, in the Sud Tyrol and, and in Austria, where they are like like sort of a, a teepee shape long long passages of these with the grapes hanging down and you go underneath that it's like this long tunnel very cool way to, to grow grapes or sometimes a flat trellis like this where they're hanging down but they go for miles um so um in any case most of that wine goes through the river networks up the rhine to cologne which is the major export city and then um transport then distributed in a million different directions so i should say also um, like in um, France, many of the producers here are monastic orders. Um, the Cistercians, for example, when they founded new orders, they brought winemaking techniques with them, and they tend to move in places that are sort of remote and in the hinterland because they're, um, they're at least initially, not interested in trade and contact with civilization, but civilization tends to sprout up around them. Um, and, and in the north, you know, it's, of course, more challenging to grow grapes. So most of what they plant is, is a white wine. Um, 
And I think let's let's look for a to look at the specific viticultural methods. Let's look at a um, a series of paintings that is called the Très Riche Heure uh, du Duc du Berry, which is um, a whole cycle of agricultural events that's depicted in uh, paintings uh, by the um, what's the Limburg brothers is their name about 1416 these things are painted and it shows again various agricultural tasks by season um, and the month of September shows the harvest and interestingly the vines seem to be planted very low because the people are actually bending down to pick them which is really really kind of odd um, the, the, this incidentally takes place in Anjou, in the northwestern part of France. And the um, illustration for March shows how the vines were pruned. It involved leaving three spurs on the trunk, and again, very, very low. And also note, um, I think the importance of that is you're getting much less fruit, which means higher intensity of flavor and quality. You know, if you just let the vines go and, and produce willy-nilly, they will have high volume and low quality because there's, there's more water in them and, you know, and less sugar. You cut them back, you punish the vines, so to speak, and they perform better. Um, so, um, I, and also note in these illustrations that is that they're all taking place outside the walls of a fanciful castle. Um, so my guess is that this is the Lord's demean. This is, you know, um, and it is large scale viticulture. This is not small holdings at all. And what this meant is that you have so many grapes coming off the vines at once within a week or two that you need a much more efficient press, a large screw press. Um, very expensive and really only affordable to, the, to someone like the Lord of a Manor, someone who has money to invest in this as a business, really. Um, now, he might charge, also charge a fee or a proportion of the wine to let the peasants press their own grapes, um, much as a fee would be he would charge to let them uh, to mill their grain or um, or whatever it may be these are all or fish in the river these are all seigneurial privileges that are part of feudalism that if the peasants want something even if they want to inherit land they pay a fee if they want to get married they pay a fee so this is how he um, you know he doesn't have rent in cash so this is how he makes his money um, the peasants could also have their own small-scale production that's for their own consumption, but remember, they're going to be using much cruder methods. They're going to get um, wild and crazy wine <laughs> like we made, right? Um, and this meant that the wine was actually a lot more diverse, a lot more extensive than in later centuries when everything becomes industrial. You get certain very narrow varieties, certain production methods that become standardized, but Middle Ages, it's all over the place, a million different kinds of local wines. Um, this has something to do with the weather, but I think it also has to do with the system of land holding that at no time in French history, amazingly enough, was there more wine grown uh, geographically than in the 13th century. That was the height of French wine production. Um, much less acreage now, much higher quality now, but also much less acreage. Um, and in fact, there's more volume now, but we're just talking about, about the land planted to grapevines. Um, this is even more true of England. You find wine grown all the way in the north in Durham. Durham is like way up near Scotland. Um, in the Domesday Book, which is uh, compiled in the 1080s by William the Conqueror, he wants to take a census, basically. There were numerous manors already listed as having vineyards. So I guess it's safe to say that medieval people love wine so much that they plant grapes in the most far-flung places, anywhere it will grow. Um, but it was also possible to do so in a way that when we see in succeeding centuries, when we get to the 16th, 17th, 18th century, those places cannot grow wine. And they can't really until we get to the 21st century. And, and even still, there, there are places where it can't be done. It was done in the Middle Ages. Um, thanks to global warming. Now we're growing grapes in more northerly places. Um, let's, let's read some, some good poetry. So there's a, there's a wine poem called La Bataille des Vins, which is the Battle of the Wines, written by this guy, uh, Henri Dondelli in 1225, in which wines from various places in France have a battle to see which one would be the favorite of King Philip IV, uh, Augustus, who is the, uh, the King of France. And interestingly, there are many vineyards mentioned far, far to the north, um, which do not grow wine grapes today. Um, these wines are considered um, 
poor, and so they're they're excommunicated in the poem, which is funny. Uh, the wines from Normandy and from Brittany, for example, where they don't grow grapes today. Um, one uh, wine is accused of causing flatulence, another <laughs> apparently makes you itch. I don't know how that happens, but many of the the favorites um, come do still come from northern France, nonetheless. Places like um, Champagne, right? Still makes grapes in, in the north. So let's let me read you a little um, um, in. Well, I'm just going to read it in French, and I think I'm going to have to translate this on the fly. Okay, so Volet voir en grande fable. Um, if you want to hear a great fable. Qui la vin l'autrier fou la table. Who, which happened the other day um, at the table. Au bon roi qui haute non Philippe, qui volontiers moïse sa pipe, fa pipe. So um, the, the king named Philip is there, and he... Um, um, Du bon vin qui estoit du blanc, of good wine, which was white. Il le senti, uh, fonti gentil et franc. He, it seemed to him um, sweet uh, and pleasant. Uh, si le clamoir font amour pour le bien et pour la douceur. It it's, it clamored um, his love for being um, good and sweet. Qui le vin avoir des dents, des dents voit le roi en bouffons avoir foi. Um, I guess I'm not going to read all this through, but but the point is, let's um, give you the ones that really win. So, premier mandat le vin du Cypre. Cyper. Cyprus gets the number one. Ce toi pas servoise de Ypres. It was not the beer of Ypres, which is in Flanders. Or Y-P-R-E-S. Remember, there's a World War One battle there. Um, so in any case, the fascinating things about this is the wines that win this competition are all white. Um, and the one that wins is, and is chosen to be Pope in this weird poem, um, it comes from Cyprus, which means it's sweet, it's high in alcohol. Uh, it may be something like, well, Comandaria is uh, red, but that's, that's a, a wine we know, medieval wine, comes from that same place. Um, another one that comes from Aquila is made Legate, which is second best. Um, both are, again, imported wine. That's the interesting thing. And I guess they're, you know, they're, they're not being snobs about French wine yet, <laughs> right? They're, they're, they're admitting the stuff from Crete is better. So, so the taste is for sweet, heavy, high alcohol wine that'll ship and tastes lovely, right? There's no, no prejudice against sweetness. Sweetness is expensive. Sweetness, remember sugar is, is the, one of the more expensive things you can get. So if it's in your, if your wine is sweet, then it's, it's better. Um, and, uh, you know, and of course the, these imported wines carry more cachet because they're expensive. Um, so let's, let's pause for a moment with this, um, kind of, um, wine I just mentioned, the Comandaria. Um, it's a strange wine. It's, it's amber colored or brownish sometimes. Okay. So it's a, so it's an odd color made of red and white grapes that are first dried in the sun. So this is a weird thing. They become raisins, um, and it's fortified. So you distill wine, you add it. So it's up, up at about 20%. That's, that's pretty high for wine, obviously. Um, kind of like port, right? Um, it's been made in Cyprus since ancient times, at least that, that grape. Uh, Hesiod in 800 BC actually even mentions drying grapes to make wine. Um, uh, he calls it a kind of Cypriot mana. Um, and is, and it, it is claimed that this is the oldest wine still in production um, that goes back 800 BC. Um, but the name actually comes from the Crusades, the year 1192, when Christians were kicked out of the Holy Land by, um, by Muslims. And Richard the Lionheart said, oh, well, I guess we don't get to have Jerusalem. Let's invade Cyprus. <laughs> swear to God, it's sort of a, a consolation prize for him. Um, and of course, the um, English king can't govern it, so he uh, sold it to the Knights Templar. This is a um, uh, an order of um, a sec almost secretive order of knights that um, fought in the Holy Land and took special vows and whatever. So he sells it to them, and then they realize they can't run the whole estate, so they sell it to the local nobility, uh, Lusignan. Okay, this is their, their Venetian in extraction. Um, and the head of that family, Guy de Lusignan, was made king of Jerusalem 
in exile. Okay, <laughs> this sounds really weird, but this is this is how the Crusades work. Okay, very very bizarre. Um, and he invited a whole slew of French feudal aristocrats to settle on the island to be his knights. Okay, um, among those were the Knights of Saint John, who built a castle there under his um, under his rule as king, and it was called La Grande Commanderie. Um, Richard the Lionheart loved the wine from this place so much that he served it at his, at his wedding and he pronounced it the wine of kings and the king of wines. Okay, Budweiser stole that phrase. The, the beer of kings, the king of beers. Isn't it Budweiser? Anyway, um, so basically this is the oldest wine we have known by a specific name from a distinct place where it's still made today. The exact same wine, okay? Um, so so uh, the Count Wilbrand of Oldenburg visited this island in 1212, and he said, the wines of this island are so thick and rich as if they're meant to be consumed like honey on bread. <laughs> okay, so that gives you an idea of, of how sweet it is and how thick it is. I think it's really kind of amazing. So, but let's let's think a little further about the... Um, the sweetness of wine, which is a strange thing, because I think with the exception of um, a couple of very good dessert wines, things like Tok Tokai, which comes from Hungary, or Sauternes, which is grown in France, in which the, um, the Poriteur Noble, the noble rot, attacks the grapes, they shrivel a little um, from this mold, and then the, the wine becomes more concentrated, Sauternes is beautiful. Um, and of course, ports, you know, are, are a red sweet wine, which are come from Portugal. Um, and even in our area, you could find a late harvest Zin. Okay, so there's, there are this whole category of dessert wines. We'll, we'll talk about them later in the course. But most sweet wine today is looked down upon. Now, so this is a question. Is it that the medieval palate was um, unsophisticated or somehow infantile because they liked sweet things, you know, and the question I would really want to ask sort of in, in, in the context of history is why did they like sweet wines? What is it about that that, um, you know, pleased them so much? Um, I think we have to think of how sugar basically changed in meaning. In the Middle Ages, sugar is a really expensive imported luxury item, comes in very small quantity. And if you can serve sugar on food, you are rich. And they do put it on everything. They put it, you know, especially late, later Middle Ages and up into the beginning of the 16th century, they put it on pasta, they put it on chicken, it goes into everything, okay? And the way we use salt, in a way. Um, that's because it denotes class and status. Um, so, the, so the sweetness is not just in, um, in the food, but it's in the wine, right? They want sweet wines intentionally. Um, now, why is it later devalued? Well, let's think about this. Sugar, after the 16th century, mid 16th century, begins to be grown in the New World. They start to import slaves from Africa to grow it, so it becomes not just much greater in volume, but the price of sugar goes down, right? They're, they're importing it um, not from India or the East, but they're getting it from the New World and they're bringing it themselves in their own ships, okay, from Brazil, from the Caribbean. Um, which means its price goes down, right? Its status drops. Um, and when we, and so it goes out of cooking, it's, it's sort of vanished to the end of meals and desserts and likewise sweet wines also to some extent. Um, and in the industrial era, it becomes super, super cheap, right? And it goes into crappy candy and, and there's, there's nothing less sophisticated than can cheap candy. So sweet wines go the same way, right? Um, and sweetness is devalued, let's say culturally, you know, and aesthetically. It's, it's okay in a dessert, but of course you, you don't really start a meal with it, and you just certainly wouldn't serve a sweet wine with your meal. That would be unthinkable. Um, and I think this process, of course, goes in interesting cycles, but right now we're in a cycle where sweet wine is, it's, it would actually be very hard to find unless you're buying real junk. I mean, unless you're buying like, I don't know, pink Zinfandel or something, or the worst, you know, Chardonnay, then it's going to be on the sweet side. But um, in general, sweetness has gone out of wines um, increasingly because sugar is devalued, right? Culturally. Um, I think it would also be um, surprising to us to 
recognize that medieval people really liked their wine adulterated also, um, like ancient Rome did. They added sugar to it, they added spices, they added saffron. The, of course, these wine, these uh, ingredients are considered quasi-medicinal, so they're, you know, um, but it's, um, so it's not exactly mulled because it's not consumed hot, but let's call it just spiced wine. It's something like the Conditum Paradoxum that we tasted with Apicius, but now it's called Hippocras, okay? H-Y-P-O-C-R-A-S, okay? And let me give you a, um, a, a translation of one of these recipes, just to give you an idea of what it is. The source, this is, comes from uh, Le Ménager de Paris, who was a middle class, um, maybe a lawyer or something like that, who married a younger wife and he expected that he would die and that she would have to remarry. So he actually um, teaches her, you know, cooking and how to shop and how to clean and how to order servants around and the expectation that she's going to have to know this stuff when she looks for another husband in the household. It's really strange in that respect. But in any case, good recipe for Hippocras. Let me give it to you from um, Le Ménager du Paris. To make powdered Hippocras, take a quarter ounce of very fine cinnamon, hand-picked by tasting it, just buy any crap, pre-ground, of course not, and an ounce of very fine mesh ginger, an ounce of grains of paradise. That comes from the west coast of Africa. That's uh, malagueta pepper. That's something that the ancients didn't have, okay? Um, a sixth of an ounce of nutmeg, which also the um, ancient Romans didn't have. Uh, that comes from ba um, the island of Banda in Indonesia. Uh, and galangal, which comes from uh, Southeast Asia, pounded together. Um, and when you want to make Hippocras, take a good half ounce or more of this powder and two quarter ounces of sugar, mix them together, and a quart of wine is measured in Paris. Um, and note that the powder and sugar mixed together make something that's called Duke's powder. So it's something you sprinkle on food, you put it all over the place. Now, I'm not sure what a powdered spices in the wine would do. It'd make it kind of muddy, right? I would, um, at least when I do this, I usually try to keep the spices whole and then filter them out so you have clear wine but he's powdering he's grinding it up and adding it um here's another one this is from le viandier de Teyevant, and Teyevant was the um nickname it means to slice wind so presumably that's what he's doing with his knife um he was it's the nickname for guillaume tirel who was the chef to charles the fifth king of france um he didn't really write this cookbook. He collected the recipes. So they appear in manuscripts even before he was born. But in any case, it's the book that's attributed to him. And it's when it's published, his name, Teyavant, goes on it. So let's just say it's Teyavant. Um, Hippocras. Take four ounces very fine cinnamon, two ounces of fine cassia flowers. Now, the, the buds of cassia dried are... Um, when you buy cinnamon in the store, pre-ground, it's actually cassia. It's not, it's not true Ceylon cinnamon. It's darker, it's much stronger. But the buds are remarkable, and they're really strong and lovely. I don't know why they've gone out of fact. You can't, they're very hard to find. Um, but they taste like this intense cinnamon flavor. So anyway, an ounce of selected mecca ginger, an ounce of grains of paradise, a sixth ounce of nutmeg and galangal combined. Crush them all together. Take a good half ounce of this powder with eight ounces of sugar. Um, and mix it with a quart of wine. Here's another interesting one. Um, five parts cinnamon, three parts clove, ginger, uh, and a sombre of sugar. Put it in a glazed earthenware pot, give it a boil. When it comes to the boil, strain it through your sleeve so it comes out clear. And I like that one better because it, uh, a sleeve is like a cloth sieve. So when you pour it in, all the spices stay in here in the muck, and then you get a clear wine at the bottom. I think that makes perfect sense. But let's, um, let's close here with a discussion of um, the Carmina Burana, which we mentioned the other day in class, and I said we'd get to it. Um, there are lots of wonderful versions online. We, we will watch one of those. But I want you to think of the, uh, the song, In Taberna, Quando Sumus Non Curamus Quid Situmus, Sed Ad Ludem Properamus Qui Semper In Sudamus. We're at a university. This is a student's drinking song. Quid agatur in taberna, ubi numus et picerna, hoc est opus ut quareretur, which we're, we're looking for, si quid locur audiatur. 
Um, when in the tavern, we do not think about mortality, but get right down to gambling, which always raises a sweat. What goes on in the tavern where a penny gets you a drink? If that's what you want to know, listen to what I tell you. Okay, so the, so the whole drinking song is about gambling, drinking, behaving indiscreetly. Um, some people lose their clothes, others win clothes to put on, some wear, leave wearing sacks, which is very funny. Um, but nobody fears death, they throw the dice for Bacchus. Um, the libertines are toasting the wine they drink, and then they drink to everyone. They drink to the prisoners, they bring, drink to captives, they drink uh, to the living, then to Christendom, to the faithful departed, to the painted sisters, you know what that means, to the forest soldiers, and then the eighth time they drink to wayward brothers, ninth to monks all over the world, tenth to those at sea, eleventh to those who are at odds, twelfth for the penitent, thirteenth for those who undertake journeys, and then finally to the king and to the pope, they drink without limit. So this is after 15 drinks. So they're sloshed at this point. The mistress, mistress drinks, the master drinks, the soldier and the cleric drink. He drinks, she drinks, the servant and the handmaiden drink. The white man, the black man drink, the steady and the capricious drink, the illiterate and the professor drink. The pauper and the sick man drink, the exile and the stranger drink, the boy drinks, the old man drinks, the bishop and the deacon drink, the sister and the brother drink, the old lady and the mother drink. This one drinks and that one drinks, a hundred drink, a thousand drink. For about six hundred turns they continue drinking immoderately and without measure. Um, even though they drink innocently, most people disapprove, and therefore we will always be outcasts. May those who disapprove be damned and never be inscribed with good people. So, okay, it is fun. Um, but I would like you to, um, on your own, here's your assignment, um, we'll look at it in class also, but go on YouTube and I want you to look for a guy named Juan Ponce, P-O-N-C-E, Ave Color Vini Clare, Clary, which means hail um, the color of, it's either clear wine or claret wine, okay? Uh, Ave Color Vini, V-I-N-I, C-L-A-R-I, okay? Look for Juan Ponce and it's... Um, it's a great poem, and I'll we'll translate it in class, and I'll see you, um, I guess, next time. Bye.